What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to our new broadcast station, KBOO, in Portland, Oregon. Thanks for tuning in. This is Madness Radio, and I'm your host, Will Hall. Uh, Today, it's my great honor to have one of the leading uh, critics and campaigners against the psychiatric drug industry, Dr. Peter Bregan, on the show. He has been involved in reform work around psychiatry for more than 50 years. His latest book is called The Conscience of Psychiatry, the Reform Work of Peter R. Bregan, MD. He's a graduate of Harvard College, and he's often a medical expert in liability lawsuits against psychiatric drug manufacturers. He is also the author of the recent book, Medication Madness, The Role of Psychiatric Drugs in Cases of Suicide, Violence, and Crime. So thank you very much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Peter Bregan. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I uh, have a long, long history, of course, of working with survivors of psychiatric abuse, and I know that your heart is there, too. And so I'm very, very happy to be on the show. And for the first time, I'm talking about uh, our new book, uh, The Conscience of Psychiatry, which I didn't write. It's actually written and edited by the Center for, for the Study of Psychiatry, the International Center for the Study of Psychiatry and Psychology. And it's uh, available on our website, bregan.com, but won't be published for about a month. But if you you know get the book now, you get a free bonus interview. <laughs> Um, but it's actually the story of my life's work, which has never been told from a positive viewpoint before in a book uh, form. There have been a couple of books that attacked me because it was easier to get books attacking me published than books praising me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, the uh, the book starts back in college when um, I was planning to be probably a professor of history and American history and literature. Um, and uh, a friend of mine asked me to go out to a state mental hospital, and I was so shaken and appalled by what I witnessed at the hospital. It reminded me, above all else, of my Uncle Dutch's descriptions of liberating a Nazi extermination camp. You know, the patients in, in 1954, we're talking about the patients in 1954 were housed in these dungeon-like cement corridors, you know, with a locked sleeping quarters where they slept on practically on top of each other, but it was locked during the day, so you couldn't even rest. People would lay on hard wooden benches or heavy wooden chairs that would bolt to the floor. There'd be a TV that wasn't working, you know, uh, doing uh, making funny uh, pictures up on the wall, and patients would abuse each other. AIDS would come in and abuse the patients. The doctors almost never appeared on the wards. And, Patients were drugged out of their minds, and they were lobotomized, they were shocked, they were given insulin coma. And as college volunteers, I was a freshman at Harvard, as college volunteers, we found that we meant everything in the world to these people when we came on the wards, that supposedly violent patients on violent wards never laid a hand on any of us in anger uh, or in any way, except they maybe give us a hug when we were leaving. Uh, people were so desperate to, to have some meaning that uh, women would stop us on the ward and say, may I polish your watch for you? I mean, the saddest thing in the world. And I'd take my watch off, figure I'd never see it again, discovered I got it back polished. Um, uh, again and again, uh, the the human quality of the human beings came out, and it became apparent to me in a short period of time that, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. I mean, I could imagine having a... Uh, enough trauma in my life and disappointment and misery and and the family uh, disorder that I could have I could have been there with any one of these people I didn't feel much different from them other than more more blessed and maybe a little more able and so I began working in these hospitals eventually I led the Harvard Radcliffe Mental Hospital volunteer program we established that that we as students if given a group of supposedly backward, sort of incorrigible, untreatable patients, that 15 of us to start, we were each given our own. We had just the supervision of a social worker who met with the group once a week, and we got almost everybody out of the hospital. Originally, they were just hoping we wouldn't hurt the patients. We got them out of the hospital. 
and we we set I set this program up almost against the wishes of the superintendent. But when he when he balked, I said, "Well, we'll take our program to another state hospital. There were other others around the area," and he, so he caved in. We were so successful. Uh, you know, we were covered in Saturday Evening Post. <laughs> my my picture in the media for the first time at probably age 19 in the Saturday Evening Post. And uh, we were written up in the President's Commission on Mental uh, mental Health uh, as one of the solutions to the psychiatric uh, overwhelming crisis in the state mental hospitals at the time. And this was work that you did as an undergraduate in, uh, in Harvard, is that right? Yeah literally an undergraduate. I even went to, you know, in those days, students didn't go and demand new courses and stuff. You know, you did what you were told. But I actually went to the head of the Department of Psychology, Robert White, and said, hey, I think there's a great idea here for a course, too. Let's set up a seminar at Harvard where students get credit and can read about human relations and psychology and go out to the hospital and work with a patient for the year. So it actually became a course uh, after I, I left school, of just about the time I left. And actually uh, came up with the idea for and co-authored my first book at that age, which was about the mental hospital program. So I got started, you know, totally by chance as a result of this experience where, where I saw this horrendous atrocity going on, discovered what it really meant to be a human being subjected to horrible conditions of life, and, and realized that by reaching out, human being, human being, you could have this enormous impact on the other person. The other person could respond and get stronger and take more charge of his or her life and actually be able to leave these concentration camps, which is what they really, really were. And so that got me started as a reformer. I went to medical school because of that experience to become a psychiatrist. And then you've been doing that work for 50 years and have become really a tremendously um, prominent, internationally known um, leader in the reform movement around psychiatry. It sounds like those were the days when lobotomy was still uh, being used. Was that one of the first uh, campaigns that you were involved with, was the anti-lobotomy? Yeah, I actually saw lobotomized patients on the wards. I think they had stopped lobotomy on those in that particular hospital by 1954. It was beginning to tail off in the mid-50s. And uh, what happened is I ended up, you know, I went through my training and I was, you know, your top student kind of guy and so I went from after my training was finished, which included Harvard again and, and the residency program for a year. Um, I ended up going to the National Institute of Mental Health for two years uh, and uh, doing doing my army time as a commissioned officer. I, vol- I volunteered to do that and, and went into the public health service for and was at the National Institute of Mental Health. But during that time, I saw that psychiatry had drastically changed, and there was no longer any place for a volunteer program. Uh, the program had lasted for a c- couple of decades, but it was it was either dying at the time or going to die, the Harvard program, because there was no way to, no compatibility between the growing influence of the drug companies at the government level and at the psychiatric association level. That was incompatible with the idea that uh, human services, human caring, even student volunteers could tremendously change the course of people's lives by working with them. That was incompatible with the idea that you have a biochemical imbalance and you have to take a product from Eli Lilly or Upjohn or some other drug company. So uh, the drug companies won. And um, there was actually, by the time I finished NIMH, uh, psychiatry had been so taken over by biological psychiatry, there was no place anymore for the kind of social psychiatry or the psychosocial psychiatry that I had been practicing as a, as a youngster in the state hospital. There were no more professors of psychiatry who were going to support that, no more psychiatric institutions. Now, what year, what year was that 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 transition took place, do you think? Well, the, the transition was becoming apparent in 1966 uh, six and 68 when I was at NIMH, and then in the early 70s it totally occurred. And so I ended up saying to myself, well, it's not the psychiatry that I thought I was joining that had at least two different schools, the psychosocial and the drug. It was all drug and biology and shock treatment. And so I went into private practice, and uh, I was actually in a good old boys club called the Washington School of Psychiatry. I was the young Turk in this this, uh, esteemed organization, and I settled down to a comfortable life of uh, in the early 70s of doing psychotherapy and writing some books and articles 
and I discovered lobotomy was coming back, and that so appalled me that I began an international campaign to stop the return of lobotomy and psychosurgery. And this was in the late uh, late 60s? Early, early 70s. Uh, probably 72 would be the start date. And it was about the same time that the psychiatric survivor and ex-patient movement is getting started. Is that right? Well, that is so right. And in fact, um, one of my earliest experiences in... Uh, in the, in the area of the re- of reform work and trying to stop psychosurgery was going out to the west coast and meeting Leonard Frank who uh had been subjected to shock treatment including insulin coma treatment in the 60s and who was trying to recover and doing a an amazing job of retraining his mind it was so interesting he's such an example Leonard he Leonard became a dear and close friend we worked together very closely for many many years Leonard began retraining his mind. He was an educated person, educated young man when, 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 when he was assaulted in this manner in a mental hospital. And he retrained his mind in part by learning, uh, memorizing and collecting quotations of wisdom. Well, he did such a good job at this that eventually he became a successfully published author's, author of uh, quotationaries of books of quotations on various subjects and has published several with major publishing houses so he actually is an example that even when your brain is badly injured the spirit can overcome this the spirit can survive and grow and even find in the damage a successful way of, of healing and of finding a new life and of course, Leonard became very, very active in the psychiatric survivor movement. And in my early days uh, of trying to take on psychosurgery, there were hardly anybody on my side except the psychiatric survivors. I mean, I got attacked by the AMA, the American Psychiatric Association, the National Institute of Mental Health. Ted Kennedy in Congress even attacked me because he, uh, I, I knew the secret, but he hadn't yet let out that the uh, with Rosemary been lobotomized. So I had enemies galore, and one of the few friend, friends I had and I worked very closely with were the psychiatric survivors. Now, one of the images that we have is that, well, lobotomy was this kind of barbaric throwback, and sort of the enlightened um, psychiatric profession sort of realized that it needed to go beyond lobotomy and use more humane treatments. But actually what you're saying is that um, as recently as the early 1970s, there was a push to return and promote lobotomy and psychosurgery. And it was only a protest movement that you were the prominent leader of, along with the psychiatric survivors, that um, that prevented that. Is that right? Oh, totally. I mean, I actually took three years out of my life to lobby Congress, go on every radio and television show I could, speak to the newspapers, uh, organize. Uh, you know, I, I didn't participate in the picketing because I thought that that would di- maybe diminish from my professional activity but I worked with people who were picketing uh, various institutions and doctors who were doing psychosurgery. I cut off federal funds to powerful Harvard psychosurgeons by uh, humiliating the federal government for giving them money and uh, stopped one of the most horrendous practices I've ever seen in my life, which was uh, a guy named O.J. Andy who was sticking electric in the heads of little black children as young as age five down in Mississippi at a dozen or so children. He'd leave these electrodes hanging outside their heads. The kids used to call each other bugs because they looked so weird. And then he'd stimulate their brains, and then he'd burn holes in their heads. Help me, God, that's what he did. He was was mainly just experimenting, you know. I mean, he'd just go on a ward, and he'd pick a kid and take him out and do it to him. Uh, He had no protocols or anything, but the goal was, believe it or not, was to stop hyperactivity on the wards. Aggression and hyperactivity on the wards by obliterating brain tissue. I mean, it was a disaster. And I, one of my proud achievements was stopping that program dead in its tracks. And that, that got me a lot of support from African Americans, who were another group that tremendously supported, including the Black Caucus of the U.S. Congress. And I ended up with... Uh, an interesting coalition. I, I formed what's still the International Center for the Study of Psychiatry and Psychology, in ICSPP, ICSPP.org. I worked with the Black Caucus in those days. Uh, on my board of directors was Ron Dellums from Berkeley and uh, Louis Stokes from Cleveland. 
And then also uh, conservative senators uh, worked with me because they thought lobotomy was immoral. And I, I worked very closely with a number of conservatives in the government as well as the Black Caucus. So it was quite a coalition of people who, for different reasons, thought psychosurgery was an evil. And so that era, that early 70s um, work, that campaigning, really defined a lot of what public awareness there is of the psychiatric abuses in the system and really kind of created an incredible impact on the popular culture. And that really the work that you did and was done then really helped us today to have the some degree of awareness of psychiatric abuse and some degree of, of criticism. Right. Uh, the film, the uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I think was part of that, but there was a whole kind of era of uh, uprising really against the psychiatric abuse that you were really playing a central part in. And I, I know that one of the most important things about your work is that when we're talking about lobotomy and we're talking about the barbarism of lobotomy, what you are pointing out is that same barbaric mentality, the same sort of complete disregard for the um, impact on the lives of the patients really continues with the um, the other treatments that are going on, primarily the medication treatments that are going on today, as well as, as electroshock. So after you were able to get, um, and the campaign was able to get lobotomy um, to be stopped as a resurgence, what about the rise of medications? How did that go, and what kind of work have you done around that? Well, you're very right about the comparison between lobotomy and all the other treatments, and I didn't really get it at first. I mean, I was actually rather puzzled that all of the powers in psychiatry and medicine uh, came down on me, this lone, you know, young, relatively innocent psychiatrist who was just trying to stop lobotomy. I thought, hey, man, this, you know, they're going to they're gonna support me. There'll be professors of psychiatry and heads of departments and all these other people supporting me. Well, there weren't. And I didn't get it at first. But then it began to dawn on me that the model of lobotomy, which is to destroy or impair brain function, is, is actually the model of all psychiatric treatment. It didn't dawn on me. Uh, the first part of it that I began to grasp, of course, was shock treatment. That, well, yeah, now let's look at shock. So I started looking in the shock treatment. I found out that the guys who promoted shock lied about their own research. They do a paper showing damage and then write in the conclusion it was harmless and then tell everybody it was harmless. I discovered that the shock treatment was, in fact, a closed head lobotomy, passing electricity through the frontal lobes to cause damage without opening the head and causing such trauma that patients would have a seizure. That was part of the process, and then they'd get, end up with an or, what we used to call an organic brain syndrome or in a delirium uh, as their brains were just totally disorganized by this assault. So I realized, now, wait a minute. So shock treatment's really not different at all. So then the next thing I looked at was the neuroleptics, uh, the antipsychotic drugs, which at the time were things like Thorazine and Melaril and Stelazine and Trilophon and Nabane. We hadn't yet hit the era of the so-called atypicals, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I looked at them and said, now, wait a minute. Now, what are they doing? Oh, they're blocking dopamine. Well, where do dopamine nerves go? What are we blocking? Why? The dopaminergic nerve system is the major trunk to the frontal lobes. So you'd see a picture, and I'd see a picture in a textbook of psychiatry, and it would... It would show a brain, the frontal lobes, the nerve tracts of the frontal lobes. It would show the suppression in those tracts caused by um, uh, the uh, neuroleptic drugs. And I would think, well, underneath there's going to be a statement saying chemical lobotomy. <laughs> but instead it would say correcting biochemical imbalances. When it was obviously a chemical lobotomy that affected dogs and and chimps the same way it affected people. Well, it's really interesting that you that you say that because um, I've had a Robert Whitaker on the show before, and he says that in the early days when lobotomy was considered this great, effective, wonderful treatment that was really celebrated, 
uh, by the uh, by the profession. And I think we should remember that the inventor of lobotomy was actually given a Nobel Prize for medicine. Um, in the early days, when the antipsychotic drugs were first introduced, Thorazine and Stelazine and the others were first introduced, they were described as a chemical lobotomy because it was considered a good thing. It wasn't a criticism. So that's actually originally, the comparison was actually originally made in a favorable way. Well, that's right. It wasn't the drug, the companies themselves didn't use that language, but the clinicians did on the wards. And of course, Whitaker got that from my research because that was one of the major points that I made continually was, look, initially when people were being honest, they talked about how there was no curative value. Patients didn't stop hallucinating or having delusions or anything else like that. Just everybody cared less about what they were going through. They became indifferent to themselves um, and that this was a virtual or comparable to a chemical lobotomy. And I, you know, I quote a lot of folks on that in my various uh, books. Uh, for people who are interested in the really hard science uh, about this, um, I've revised and, and we just, uh, le- um, you know, last August came out with the second edition of Brain Disabling Treatments in Psychiatry. And you can get that, you know, through bookstores or on the web uh, or from, from my website, bregan.com. Brain Disabling Treatments in Psychiatry discusses all the issues I'm giving you in, in lay language and in a popular version today, discusses them in detail. In um, in a scientific format, so we have all of that that data there for people who want to want to you know get confirmation of what I'm saying. Well, one of the things that's most disturbing about the use of electroshock therapy or electroconvulsive therapy that it's now been sort of rebranded as is that there haven't actually been simple effectiveness studies that the industry has actually blocked simple studies where you would take a brain that has been recently shocked and compare it to a brain that hasn't been shocked right. and say, well, what kind of damage might be done here? Well, that's, that's right. And we can still have enough research that I put together, and you can find it in Brain Disabling Treatments in Psychiatry, to demonstrate without a question that it does cause serious brain damage. And we have a brand new study that came out about a year ago that the, that the shock doctors them said, themselves did following up their own uh, patients out in the communities, you know, regular routine patients over a period of many, many months or, or years, and and they found, as you read the study, that, that basically these patients became demented from the shock treatment. So what did they do with the study? They were stuck with it. They had about 12 authors. It was hard to hide. So they published it in an obscure journal, and it's never been discussed, as far as I know, in any major sources in psychiatry. The final proof from the docs themselves that if you follow up routinely treated patients, they are just destroyed by shock treatment. Well, and then then the uh, FDA a decade or more ago decided it was going to finally look at shock machines because they've grandfathered them in. FDA is supposed to study psychiatric and medical technology, so they wanted to require safety tests. Now, you'd think that psychiatry would want safety tests, wouldn't you? Well, of course they didn't. And the FDA tentatively put forward the intention to require safety tests. Well, they were just creamed by organized psychiatry, led by the American Psychiatric Association. The FDA backed down to this day, to this day. The electroshock machines have not been tested for the most basic issues of safety or efficacy. A lot of people may be listening to the show. Some people may have had electroshock therapy, or they may know people, and they may feel positive about it. There's a lot of publicity and that's pro electroshock in the, right. in the media. And of course, many, many people are very pro psychiatric drugs. I myself am pro uh, choice um, in terms of people's decisions, but some people feel so positive about these, these treatments that a lot of the driving uh, force in society for continuing the treatments tends to also be patients who feel good about what has happened to them. Can you tell us a little bit about that, and why do you think these these treatments continue even though they are so dangerous? It's very hard for the psychiatrist to come up with patients to testify on behalf of uh, psychosurgery. Uh, and In fact, it's practically impossible and very hard for them to get ones to testify about electroshock. Um, I remember back in the 70s, they trooped out a patient at the uh, American Psychiatric Association at a meeting I attended at the association on lobotomy, and I had my little tape recorder up front, and um, 
uh, you could actually hear on my tape recorder the doctor trying to coach the patient who was so damaged that they couldn't even spontaneously fake a good answer. So the patient was being coached, including being coached to say she was angry at me, which was really incredible to capture on tape. And she was quite confused. So there have actually been very, very, very few testimonials. Uh, it's the only one I remember, even uh, by shock by uh, 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 lobotomy patients. They're too demo- too destroyed to get up there and and promote what's been done to them. Many of them don't even recognize that they've been lobotomized. They're in complete denial. They'll they'll say nothing was ever done to them. They'll deny the scars on their head and what they mean, and so on and so forth. It's too devastating. But it's even hard to get shock patients to testify. You know, back in those early days. Uh, with Leonard Frank um, and, and many other folks out in San Francisco, I remember going out there and testifying at committee hearings um, uh, at the San Francisco uh, City Council that ended up banning shock treatment in San Francisco. It didn't have any effect legally, but they banned shock treatment. And there were many, many patients who came forward and talked about being damaged by shock, but they could hardly come up with anybody to come up and say they'd been helped. And then in 1985, there were these... Um, meetings, um, the consensus conference on ECT was held by the federal government, and I was the only expert there on the scientific aspects of brain damage from shock treatment, but I had an impact on the conference. And and again, it was easy to get patients, former patients, to come forward and talk about brain damage, but the people who came forward and said they were helped looked terrible, looked terrible. It was incredibly sad, the two or three people they had. And one of them actually came up to me afterward and pushed a piece of paper into my hand that said, thank you for what you're doing, Dr. Bregan. Somebody who had obviously been so pushed into doing this against their will that they just wanted to thank me anyway, you know, to get to me the thank you for for taking the more truthful position in public. So, I mean, it makes me want to weep to think about that poor human being. So... But but what is true is that people who have had lobotomy or shock become docile and obedient and that and submissive. That's the effect of damaging the brain. And they often don't know how damaged they are. And I call that spellbinding. In medication madness, I talk about how all psychiatric treatments that damage the brain, which is all the medicines and shock and so on, how all of them cause what I call medication spellbinding. The technical term that I use in my scientific papers, which you can download off my website, pregnant.com. Uh, the technical term is intoxication anos agnosia, not knowing you're intoxicated. Um, it's for all psychoactive substances, and it's also brain damage. So people who have an injury to their brain, especially from psychiatric drugs, where I've studied it the most, those people, they usually and often don't know they're injured. So You'll see the person on on an antidepressant, and they'll say they, they're feeling better, but they're flat, they're withdrawn, they're obviously emotionally suppressed by the drug, but they don't know it. And if they do become aware of an adverse effect, such as agitation or anxiety, they won't say it's a drug. They have no appreciation it's the drug. Instead, they'll say it's their their husband, they'll get mad at their husband, or they'll say it's their mental illness, and they'll get suicidal. But they won't say, oh, this is the drug making me feel miserable. And then, uh, as a third point, very often as a part of medication spellbinding, people feel they're doing better than ever when they're doing worse than ever. Not unlike the person who drinks at a party and thinks that they are uh, the life of the party when they're the death of it. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and today we're speaking with uh, Dr. Peter Bregan. He's the author of more than 20 books. He's a leading psychiatrist, critic of the psychiatric drug industry. His latest book is called The Conscience of Psychiatry, The Reform Work of Peter R. Bregan, M.D. Yeah, these are making me think of some experiences from my own story. And When I was on Prozac, I was definitely having... Uh, a toxic effect from the Prozac. I was having a manic reaction from the Prozac and ended up losing a job. And I had no idea that my wild sort of behavior and my confrontational belligerent attitude that I had at my job and the sort of um, c- destruction that I was doing around me in my in my relationships at the workplace, I had no idea that that was a result of the Prozac. 
that I was taking. And I also remember when I was on um, other medications, I would have really strong agitation that would drive me into a suicidal state. I remember being on a bus and just not being able to even sit still uh, on the bus and just being completely preoccupied with killing myself because of the, the just the agitation and the, the inner kind of burning that I felt I- inside of me. And then when I was on um, a neuroleptic, when I was on uh, Navain for... Um, uh, several months, um, my personality was really, really changed. And I didn't know which way was up or which way was down. All I knew was that, you know, I I felt like I was, um, you know, calmer that I wasn't as, as, um, upset or as, as agitated as I had been, but I was, my personality was really, really different. And when I talked with people after I got off the medication, they were really kind of shocked about how much of a different person I had become while I was on the drug but when I was on it I really had had no idea what was going on and that really questions a lot of in my own mind a lot of the question of like choice and self-determination because once you have that impairment from the drug or the medication then it, it really affects your judgment so um, so profoundly and I think that's one of the important things that you're you're one of the important points that you're making in your book medication madness is that really these these psychiatric drugs are are basically function in the same way that alcohol and street drugs do and that they cause an intoxication effect, but we're not really taught or, or told that that's what's happening. We're told to see it as, oh, we're returning to our normal state from, uh, from an illness state, that these are drugs that are used to cure or to treat an illness or restore our chemical, chemical imbalances, which is not what's going on at all. And it occurs along a continuum, you know. We remember these more flagrant cases, and I've got, you know, at least 50 really documented cases in my book where I I even describe the crime scenes, you know, and visit the crime scenes and the autopsy reports and interview the surviving people and, and so on and so forth. The more subtle stuff goes overlooked and nobody sees it. So you have a man who thinks he's doing better on Prozac than he was before, but you meet with him and his wife together and she says he hasn't been interested in me in a loving way and ever since he started the drug. And he'll say, well, I feel better. I have less pain. He has no idea really of what's happened to him and he and, of course, he's been robbed of the opportunity to really grow and develop through the crisis and to triumph over the crisis and to come out a better man and a more loving man. Instead, he's coming out a less loving man and thinking that's a, a success story. It's very, very sad. And you, you described the manic episode, and for, for, for the hundreds of thousands of people who have those, there are millions of people who just get a little elated and lose track of themselves, divorce their wives, you know, or have an affair, and uh, describe these kinds of things. You know, the guy who gets involved with a hooker who's been this straight-laced man his whole life and ends up ruining his life eventually. One of the things I've noticed that's so interesting in my legal cases is that if you somebody starts on one of the newer antidepressants, Prozac, Paxil, Lexapro, Solexa, you know, Zoloft, any of them, and if he comes back in the first week or two and says to the doc, I've never felt better in my life, the doc always thinks that's great, and it's a terrible sign. If a drug says, if your drug makes you feel better than you ever have before, you're starting to get high. And you can be pretty sure that either he's going to be lucky and the drug effect wears off and now he's back to himself, or the worst alternative, it's the beginning of a manic episode. Yet doctors don't recognize it. They're not looking for that. They're not thinking that way. They actually have in mind that a drug could legitimately make you feel better than ever. Hey, man, not except by damaging your brain. You know, you can see it. You can see it if you've ever gone to a party where people are smoking marijuana and you're not. You know, they'll be giggling over the funniest things they've ever heard, and the joke is so stupid you can't even get it when you're sober. Or they'll be talking about, oh, man, this is heavy, this is profound, and somebody will say something, they'll say, oh, wow, man, that's really heavy. And, of course, it's drivel. And it's, again, an intoxication phenomenon where you're tremendously overestimating the value and importance of what you're thinking and saying, and you have no idea uh, that it's just a drug phenomenon at the time. So it's not limited to psychiatric drugs, but the disaster with psychiatric drugs is you don't expect you don't expect to develop mental and behavioral aberrations. 
And for that reason, when a person kills somebody while taking Prozac or Paxil, I've been involved in cases like that. I've been involved in a case where a man drowned his two children and himself in a tub after his third day on second or third day on Paxil. Uh, you know, a young girl on Prozac tried to kill somebody who was uh, upsetting her. Uh, and these are people who've never had any history of violent crime or homicidal yeah, behavior at all, and then cool. suddenly they take the drug and they have a reaction to the drug because the drug is basically making them they, making them high like a street drug would. Exactly, just like you know, uh, you know, taking uh, methamphetamine or something. You know, just having a, 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 a an out of control, agitated, upset, mentally disturbed reaction, a psychosis even. You know, in response. Uh, in response to the drug. And I've got case after case of these innocent people behaving this way. Medication Madness starts out with the story of a man who was really loved by his friends, a very religious man, a man who was busy at the time uh, renovating an apartment next door for his mother-in-law to live in, and who just you know really devoted himself a lot to other people. He had a history of having some sadness, a kind of Lincoln-esque sadness about life, which many people have. And he He's sitting in his doctor's office, he's going there for a physical problem, and he reads what he thinks is a scientific pamphlet, but of course it's a promotion for an antidepressant. So he asks the doc, and the doc says, uh, yeah, yeah, let's take one of those, and gives him Paxil. And he gets so agitated that he ends up driving his car into a policeman to knock down the policeman to get his gun to shoot himself. He breaks the cop's leg and injures him badly, but still the the cop and a, and, a, and a good Samaritan coming by jump on him and pull him off, and he's screaming, I don't want to hurt the cop, I just want to kill myself. And, uh, of course, he's slammed in jail and would have spent most of the rest of his life in jail. I came along, and I wrote, interviewed him. I sat in his kitchen. He was in jail. I sat in his kitchen, packed full of friends, telling me what a wonderful guy he was. I wrote a report that actually convinced the policeman that this had been a reaction to Paxil, and the cop asked for leniency, and this man came out of jail within a relatively short period of time. And it's not like, wow, he got off easy or something, you know. I mean, he himself never even wanted this defense, and he himself remained just really depressed for a long time that he would ever do this to somebody and needed a lot of help afterward to recover from what he'd done to this other human being. Now, that's been a big part of your work, has been challenging um, the psychiatric drug companies in, in court and trying to introduce evidence around drug reactions in these kind of trial settings. How has that gone? And, and I know that the pharmaceutical companies have put in a huge amount of money to the legal defense to prevent and to cover up any of this kind of evidence um, coming out and ha- getting any weight in, in courtrooms. Well, in the beginning, it was a horrendous experience and very tough, and uh, judges would get angry at me because they'd say, you know, you've got no evidence that Prozac is causing suicide, you've got no evidence that it's causing violence, and I would present my evidence, and they'd say, well, why isn't it in the FDA label? And uh, nonetheless, still won some cases. Then in 2004, the FDA starts to look into it, and the new label for antidepressants reads like my books. It talks about agitation, hostility, aggression, uh, disinhibition, loss of control, you know, hypomania, mania, all in association with these drugs, and definitively an increase in the suicide rate and uh, suicide attempt rate in young people, children, and young adults, and on and on. So, you know, it's still a compromised label, but it reads to a great extent like my, my work. And, and the FDA didn't suddenly see the light or discover the, the research. They had to actually be pressured by a giant international campaign and just tons and tons of testimony coming yep. in before they were forced against the wishes of the pharmaceutical drug manufacturers to, uh, to include these warnings on the labels. You're absolutely right. In fact, in England... Uh, the drug companies have a little less influence, still a lot, but a little less. And England was the ones to first come out and say, you know, these drugs are damaging to children. They cause more harm than good, and they cause suicidality and behavioral abnormalities in children. And uh, with a few exceptions, you just shouldn't give them to children at all. 
that sort of embarrassed the FDA and helped in the campaign. And I was lucky in that one of my scientific articles was actually distributed to all the members of the FDA panel. And the, um, their, their conclusions actually read very much. The new label reads almost the same word, well, the same words in many cases, uh, the same kind of thoughts and, uh, as, as, there, as is in that article that they, of mine that they all read and they heard my testimony. And of course, they heard the testimony of, a, I don't know, a, a well over 100 people who had been damaged or had relatives damaged by these drugs, adults and children alike. They've been very slow to admit that adults have all the same problems, but they pretty much admitted it now. I'm interested in the whole question of, of strategy and politics and the implications of your work. Now, are you suggesting that we should just basically um, ban or no longer have these drugs available to people at all on the grounds that they are too dangerous and the risks are too high. Um, what do you feel about the kind of the pro-choice approach that a lot of the survivor movement has has taken? Is that too going too easy on psychiatric drugs? So we really have a more anti-drug um, standpoint because I mean, even though there are many many people who have all these kinds of negative reactions, there are of course many people who feel very strongly that they're psychiatric drugs are helping them and that they're relying on them and that that's helped them to cope. It helps them to get through their day. They may not have the kinds of negative reactions that we're, we're talking about. So what are your thoughts about just how we should approach this right. as a movement? Well, I can just tell you about my own evolution. I think it's a very, very complicated question with no easy answers. Let me start out with that. Initially, I you know, I'm basically in my heart a libertarian. I believe in freedom and personal responsibility. And originally, I didn't want to even call for a ban on lobotomy. But when I realized that there was nobody who was consenting to lobotomy legitimately, not a single lobotomy person was really consenting, because if they were told what this surgery was really about, Nobody except a crazy person who was self-destructive would take a lobotomy. So it became obvious to me that that it was only lies and misrepresentations and the abuse of, of helpless and frightened people that allowed lobotomies to take place. So I came out for a ban on lobotomy. And, of course, that hasn't occurred, hasn't occurred, although there's been legislation that I helped create. I didn't do it alone by any means or in different states. Uh, Neurologist Robert Grimm out in Portland, Oregon, got legislation changed in Oregon that have made it really hard to do lobotomies, and none have been done in Oregon. The same in California, since the legislation was passed, because they really require informed consent. And who the heck is going to consent to such a thing? I think my own views on electroshock kind of took the, some of the same evolution, because I, I personally am in favor of a ban of electroshock therapy. My father was electroshocked, and I was very close to being given electroconvulsive therapy when I was in locked ward, and I just, I don't think that you're going to get informed consent, and I don't think that it's realistic given the kinds of, of options and alternatives that are available to people. I mean, I was offered electroconvulsive therapy because they said, well, we've, we've tried everything. Well, what they had tried was they had tried every medication that they were throwing at me in a locked ward in environment. And so, you know, I, I reached a point where I just said, look, this just does not make sense. And, you know, Linda Andre has kind of reached the same point um, with electroshock. We had her on the show recently that really let's, let's just ban electro electroconvulsive therapy. Let's just not have this um, treatment available. Now, what about the, the medications though, which is a little bit more of a complicated issue? Well, I'm with you on the electroshock too. I mean, I've come to the conclusion that damaging people's brains should be stopped. And if the profession won't do it voluntarily, then it should be stopped by other legislative means. Drugs, I agree with you, again, are more complicated. My view about children is that there's just no excuse for drugging kids with psychoactive substances. Yeah, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you there. I think it's a crime. I think it'll be looked, well, I think it's going to be looked at as our form of child abuse. You know, every generation or two has its own form of child abuse, whether it's child labor, child sex abuse. Um, I think that the drugging of children will be our massive form, unprecedentedly massive form of child abuse. And I don't mean that the abusers are the parents. The real abusers are my profession, the psychiatry, without whom none of this would be taking place. Even the pediatricians uh, wouldn't be giving out these drugs and your family docs if it wasn't for psychiatry uh, going along with all this. 
For adults, I want informed consent, and it's going to be hard to ever get, but that's about the only way you get it now is by reading a few authors like me. Uh, you don't get it from your doctors, by and large, but I mean, for adults, informed consent. I mean, these have been very hard issues, the freedom issues for me, and I accept uh, the views of people who say that there shouldn't be any banning, and I accept the views of people who say that there should be a total ban on drugging children at all and on lobotomy and shock treatment. Um, you know, the, an open society, you want to limit bans. I just think it's a tough issue. Well, I think one thing is clear is that there there shouldn't be direct consumer advertising and the kind of misleading propaganda and myth promoting that the pharmaceutical companies are doing as part of selling their drugs really just is is really really harmful in itself. I think the the side of the issue that we haven't maybe haven't talked about as much is the whole question of of the suffering and the sense of p- people being out of control. I mean, when I was taking different psychiatric medications, I was desperate for something, and I did get some relief when I took uh, a Prozac, and then it, of course, turned into that manic reaction. And I was able to, when I was on a neuroleptic, I did feel, uh, you know, calmer, and I, I got off the medications. But I, I definitely have a lot of friends, and have spoken with many, many people who they'll say, "Well, you know, I, you know, I've, I've read." Peter Bregan, and I've looked at this issue, and I understand that there are dangers and there are risks here, but I just, you know, I can't go to work without my lithium. I am, um, I, my life is now more in control now that I get some sleep with my benzodiazepines, or, you know, I got out of the hospital, and I haven't been in the hospital since now that I continue to take my, my Seroquel. So that, I think, is really the, the main thing, is the people feeling like they're making difficult choices to get their, their lives back under control. I think they're medication spellbound. That is that, inevitably, if these drugs are actually having an effect, it's a brain dysfunction. They're intoxicated in the same way that if they were drinking alcohol or taking cocaine every day as a way of coping. Right. There are probably more people who would say they can't live without, oh, I'm sure there are. There are many more people who would say they can't live without alcohol and marijuana and cocaine than who would say they can't live without psychiatric drugs. I'll bet anything on that if you added up all the illegal drugs and the recreational drugs. There'd be far more people swearing by them. But then you don't have the uh, industry telling you that you have a chemical imbalance and you need it, like uh, insulin for diabetes. And well, that's right. In fact, it's very interesting the the differences between the way the researchers and the propaganda street street drugs and psychiatric drugs. When methylphenidate, well, to give you a real example, it's in Medication Madness. When when Hopkins Johns Hopkins researchers found that Prozac was causing abnormal growth of cells in the normal brain a disastrous thing to find, they claimed it showed the drug worked. When they found a similar effect from speed being used on the street, they said that proves it's a bad drug. That's how distorted this uh, situation is. It it goes to the heart, I think, of our, and this is something that we talk about in the harm reduction to coming off psychiatric drugs that I wrote, that that we, we begin the whole discussion in that, guide with pointing out that our society is really crazy when it comes to drugs in general. We have a war on drugs that treats a certain kind of drugs as good, pharmaceuticals, their medicine, and they have a totally different kind of world that you're entering with because it's about healing and helping. And then you have a different class of drugs, which is the street drugs, the recreational drugs, the negative drugs, and they're somehow completely different. It's a different world. But actually, they're they're very, very similar the way that they operate. I mean, you are taking psychoactive substances that are changing your brain chemistry and often damaging your brain and intoxicating you and and making you high or changing your consciousness. And street drugs work the way that pharmaceutical, psychiatric drugs work in that, in that sense. Well, and they're often the same drug. I mean, on the street, you're going to get uh, all the benzos for sale, and you're going to get all the stimulants for sale. And now Seroquel apparently is becoming popular as a, as a, rec- as a illegal street drug, people wanting to get some sleep or um, also feeling high from Seroquel. So. And we should mention, um, of course, that I'm not advocating anybody abruptly stopping this psychiatric medication. Every one of my books, has, including Medication Madness, writes extensively about the hazards of withdrawing too quickly from drugs. And in Medication Madness, I go through the various categories of drugs 
and show what the special hazards are for each group of drugs when you come off of them, whether it's the mood stabilizers like lithium, where you get a withdrawal reaction of mania, or whether it's the benzos, where you get the enormous anxiety coming off of them. Well, I think if you come off of the benzos too quick, you can actually die from a benzo um, withdrawal reaction. Well, you can get a seizure, which can be uh, life-threatening if you come off the benzos too quickly. I mean, that's the, I think the, the main life threat would be to get a seizure and then you gag, or you're, you know, you have trouble retaining your breathing or you fall or you have a car accident. Well, I think this is one of the most important messages of your work is that the psychiatric drugs them, themselves, especially when you're withdrawing from them, create a psychotic reaction or, or, an, or, or a withdrawal reaction that would be seen as psychosis. And then that, the profession, in its crazy perspective, says, oh, well, this is you need the drug. You're coming off of it. You're having a reaction. Well, it's actually not a reaction. It's your mental illness that's causing this psychosis. Or it's causing this um, this symptom, and therefore you need to be back on the drug. It just proves that you need to be back on the drug, which is one of the most, I think, destructive kind of backwards logics that patients are, are given when they take these medications because it gets people stuck on them. Can you imagine the doctors uh, saying to the alcoholic, man, you, you have a potential for the DTs. We're just barely controlling it with your alcohol. Don't you dare come off. We don't have a lot more time. It's been really wonderful having you on the show. I wanted to make sure people have your contact information. Tell us about your, your latest book and the new book that's coming up and also your, your website. Well, my, my latest book in print, now gone into paperback, less than a year old is medication madness it covers all of my work in every aspect and the unique thing is that it, while every story is true it reads like a true science fiction thriller uh, with all my legal case many of my legal cases many of the stories of what's happened to people and, and uh, how these drugs have affected their lives it's really about Peter Bregan's experience with over uh, with hundreds of patients with 50 detailed cases and and I, I mean I really am able to talk about the reactions of the family and friends of what the police did what judges I have wonderful courtroom stories I'm very proud of how readable and interesting uh, medication madness is and then our center has put out this book about 50 years of my reform work called The Conscience of Psychiatry. And if you, you get a free interview with that of my, about me, uh, and the book itself will come out in the, in, later in the summer. And the website is bregan.com, B-R-E-G-G-I-N.com, B-R-E-G-G-I-N.com. And, Will, this is a great interview. Well, thank you so much. It's been really great having you on Madness Radio. It's a real great honor, and I congratulate you on your more than 50 years of work, and it's been wonderful having you here. You've been listening to an interview with Dr. P Peter Bregan. He is the author of Medication Madness, the Role of Psychiatric Drugs in Cases of Suicide, Violence, and Crime. Peter Bregan is a psychiatrist, um, graduate of Harvard College. He's a medical expert in liability lawsuits against psychiatric drug manufacturers. He's the author of more than 20 books, including Your Drug May Be Your Problem and Talking Back to Prozac, and has been a lifelong uh, crusader and reformer and leader in the movement to reform psychiatry. That's all the time we have today on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is co-sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Hosted by Will Hall, music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcast, and show archives at madnessradio.net. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network, including KBOO in Oregon, WXOJ and WBCR in Massachusetts, Alaska's KWMD, and WPRR in Michigan. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.